This is a story of how Elon Musk had an audacious dream to conquer artificial intelligence with the help of a nonprofit that he founded called OpenAI, and how it fell away from his control only to find its own footing and conquer insurmountable odds to create the most advanced large language model, the most advanced artificial intelligence platform that the world has ever seen. Leaving the much less well-known CEO at the helm, Sam Altman, somebody who has no equity in OpenAI actually, yet went on to create many models, including the ever impressive GPT models that power ChatGPT, everything Microsoft, and thousands of plugins, apps, and tools through its OpenAI API. Elon Musk, a visionary, a billionaire, with a great portfolio of technology companies under his belt. Elon Musk's fascination with artificial intelligence stems from his visions of the future. For decades, Elon Musk has talked about how artificial intelligence could usher in a whole new world of possibilities, both good and bad. It's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows. It scares the hell out of me and the rate of improvement is exponential. Now, Elon Musk always thought that artificial intelligence could provide great benefit to humanity, but there was a lot of risks. And in fact, one time on record, he even said, the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads by a lot. And needed an organization, like a nonprofit, the way OpenAI was originally founded to give it some guidance. Now to fulfill this vision, Elon Musk set out to recruit like-minded individuals. Among those were Sam Altman, a respected entrepreneur, and Ilya Suskiver, a top-notch machine learning expert. Sam Altman's history is with startups. He was the president of Y Combinator from 2014 to 2019. And for a long time, Sam Altman was concerned with the ethics around artificial intelligence developments. And this rippled through the many startups that came out of Y Combinator that he helped foster and he had close relationships with. Ilya Suskiver, who's originally from the Soviet Soviet Union is an AI researcher and computer scientist who made a great contribution to the field of deep learning. And his expertise was pushing current state-of-the-art models to new environments, trying to find new ways to make these models better and better. United by the idea to make AI beneficial and accessible to all of humanity, in December of 2015, OpenAI was born. Officially, the founders were Ilya Suskiver, Greg Brockman, Trevor Blackwell, Vicky Chung, Andre Karpathy, Dirk Kingma, Jessica Livingston, John Schultzman, Pamela Vagata, and Wojek Zarimba, with Sam Altman and Elon Musk sitting as the official board members. Although obviously a team effort, Altman and Suskiver are the key players in OpenAI's success story. Altman, as the CEO, brought his entrepreneur skills to help steer the ship, while Suskiver, as one of the leading minds, provided that technical backbone, allowing Elon Musk to bring a number of things to the table. First, the funding. Second, the recruiting power. And third, the big name recognition that they need to bring those recruits in and collect more money and build something amazing. But although there's big ambitions here, this is very much an underdog story at this point in history. The talent that Google had acquired through DeepMind and DeepBrain was unmatched. And what little competition there was for them was spread out pretty much with Microsoft, Meta, and Apple. But the real magic started to form when a guy named Greg Brockman, one of the founders I mentioned before, was promoted to the CTO of OpenAI and developed a strong relationship with Ilya. Together, they were just those two people who had the technical expertise, the brain power to think about the problem in the right way, and the trust in their CEO and the resources to make something really magical happen. And luckily, because of the open source nature and just the kind of modern media that we live in, there's all sorts of long form podcasts and blogs and interviews with these guys and I could really kind of go back in time when I was researching this paper and see how they were thinking about these problems. And what I picked up was, was a true love for reading whatever papers had come out, thinking about how that fit into the research they were doing, constantly iterating and tweaking. These guys liked to produce, they liked to execute, and they wanted to make this vision come true. You probably already know from all of the drama with Elon Musk that 
things didn't always go smoothly. So as the organization grew and they honed in on the right methodology, it became obvious that to make the models work as well as they do today, what was required was literally billions of dollars of compute power, and you gotta pay people way more than you'd think to get them to work in a nonprofit. As the organization grew, there was a split, a divergence in the visions between Elon Musk and Sam Altman on how the company should proceed. Now it seems like at this point, Musk was more worried about the dystopian outcomes. But this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. So he was mostly advocating for much more strict regulation kind of sitting on top of the system. But in contrast, OpenAI's mission was all about being free and open source and making sure that the research instantly goes out to the public. So it wasn't a lot of controls with that line of thinking. Sam Altman, Ilya, Greg, they all kind of had that idea that we just push it out as fast as possible. And remember, this is about 2016. And if you're confused about what I said, because it seems opposite of what everybody's saying today, it's because it is. This is leading up to 2018. And for whatever reason, they're sort of on the opposite sides of where they are now in this argument. But eventually this rift got so bad that it forced Elon Musk to step away from the board in 2018. Officially citing a conflict of interest, especially with Tesla that was using a lot of similar AI for the self-driving car systems. But the full story about why he really left is not 100% clear. Some people have described it as Elon trying to take over the company because he felt like Sam was moving too careful and too slow and they were getting crushed by Google. And because they had equal weight on the board and he wanted a little bit more control, he started saying, hey, I can donate a whole bunch more money if you give me a little bit more control so I can make this thing go faster and they just weren't about having that. Now from the reports, it definitely sounds like there was a huge donation that was sort of promised in the future. And I don't know if that was leverage to get more control control on the board. But the fact is, Elon did cut his ties, he did leave, and he never did make another donation to the project. And it might have been right after that moment when they said, okay, now we don't have Elon Musk, we need a bunch of resources, let's go try to get the money. And at that point, it seems like the decision to go from a nonprofit to a capped for-profit was made. And with the potential of profit, all sorts of investors, most notably Microsoft, showed up, started giving them the money they need and the cloud infrastructure they need, and the additional technical abilities from the Microsoft Azure team to build essentially the supercomputer that they need to train these trillion parameter models on. Because you have to remember, back in 2018, supercomputers that can handle this kind of computation, this sort of GPU tensor computation, at that parameter level, they just didn't exist. Like, only a team like Amazon Web Services or Microsoft Azure could even try to put something like this together. So I think that was a big part of the partnership also. But there's sort of a competing theory and some evidence to say that there's another way where Elon Musk is much more favorable than that version. Now, the other story is that they were moving gung-ho towards this for-profit model, you know, even without Elon Musk's donation, and that that was the final straw. As a dissenting voice that wanted to keep it non-profit, he felt like he had to leave. And if the truth leans towards that direction, that's the more altruistic version of Elon Musk, where he said, no, this thing is supposed to save humanity, and if we get off track, I just can't be a part of it. But if you thought two versions of the story was all I had, you're wrong. There's a third one, too. And the third version is to take the official statement with pure credibility. And this version of history would describe Elon Musk leaving the company as strictly a legal decision. One in which OpenAI was making incredible advancements in artificial intelligence as a nonprofit, and someone like Elon Musk, who had a board seat, was using that same technology, those same people, and transferring them over to private and public companies like SpaceX and Tesla. And that those conflicts of interest with all the different companies and all the different shareholders just became too much for OpenAI to focus on their one goal. And one notable thing about this too is that some of the people who were at OpenAI at this point do end up at Tesla, especially Especially this guy named Andrew Carpathy, he became the head of self-driving at Tesla after being at OpenAI, and surprisingly recently, he just went back to OpenAI, because now OpenAI is like leading the charge, so he wants to join the better team again. But no matter what story is the closest to the truth, or if it was a blend of all three, the fact is this is an expensive organization to run. The hardware cost alone for the compute power is in the billions. The top AI researchers are literally like NFL player style salaries with these private companies like Facebook and Google knowing how profitable AI could be in the future, giving them an incredible salary option. According to a Wired article, Brockman sat down with Yashua Bengio, who we covered in previous videos as one of the founding fathers of the deep learning movement. And together they drew up a list of the best research in the entire field and offered them corporate level salary positions. Not nonprofit level salaries, corporate. So 2019 rolls around, the company changes from being a nonprofit to a capped for profit. And remember that word cap, this is unique. It might be the only company in the whole world that's structured this way actually. 
So what I mean by cap for profit is that you can think of a nonprofit, which actually goes up a level. Below it, there's a new entity formed, which is for profit, but it's capped at 100X the investment. So every dollar that Microsoft gives it, they can eventually give them back $100 on the dollar. And when that's done, they can't give them any more money. And this will dissolve back into a nonprofit. Now, 100X is like a ton of money, right? Like that's rare, but if there really is, you know, hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars because AI just decimates GDP and like becomes as creative as humans in every aspect, Microsoft will just have a huge return, but they won't end up becoming that huge Goliath. It will be a nonprofit again. So now let's talk equity because this for-profit entity that's underneath the nonprofit, it can 100X at most, right? It also does have equity that were given to the different people who joined OpenAI at different times. So they have the potential to grow up with it up until that same cap point when it dissolves. Now, Sam and Ilya would say that that was required to pull the top-notch talent from places like Google because they would get stock options in Google. Now they had a similar option, something they weren't able to do as a nonprofit. Now their initial billion dollars had all sorts of different investors. Later, it became more singular from Microsoft with a $1 billion investment, especially mostly as a credit that they could use for the Azure Super cloud. And then more recently, Microsoft added another $10 billion to that investment. Now from 2019 until today, Elon Musk was, you know, just doing his thing with all those different companies he's running, especially with Tesla and Andrew Carpathy, trying to get self-driving cars working, working on the Optimus robot, doing their own thing, building the Dojo supercomputer, totally separate. But OpenAI still had a whole bunch of investment. They were bringing in some top talent. Sam was doing a great job at running the company as a CEO, and they were pushing product so fast. It's hard to actually describe how well that team was executing on just getting an idea into code, getting it to Microsoft's Azure cloud, training it, preparing the data, testing the model. Like it was really impressive what they've done. Now, OpenAI didn't have a one directional roadmap. They were actually working on multiple models to try to do different things and building teams around each of them. But the path that ended up leading to ChatGPT, GPT 1, 2, 3, and 4, all stems from a 2017 research paper that actually was open source out of Google. The paper was called Attention is All You Need, and it was a new way to think about prioritizing the inputs into these models. And from there, the long history of GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3, and most recently, the unbelievably smart, powerful, robust GPT-4 that is now powering ChatGPT, the Bing search engine, the API system, the plugin system, and is just something to marvel at. So in case you don't know, the GPT at the end of ChatGPT stands for generative because it's generatively baking all of the text, pre-trained transformer from the 2017 paper, attention is all you need from Google. So the team inside of OpenAI that was working on the GPT project was led by the researchers Alec Bradford and Tom B. Brown. And the idea to tokenize text, put it in a latent space, and just put a bunch of data in it and keep tweaking those parameters until it made sense was fascinating because most people thought it kind of would work like incrementally, but that just pumping in more data and more compute power wouldn't lead it to be so impressive. So it was a surprise even internally that GPT-3 and GPT-4 especially work so well. I've heard people ask on the team, did you guys have an inkling? Did you think this was gonna work? And they really didn't. In fact, Brian Christensen asked some of the guys over there, when did you think this was gonna work? And they said, they didn't really. They were just as surprised. I think they knew they were moving towards something, but I think everybody thought this was much further away. And part of the credit that goes to Radford and Brown isn't just in pumping in more data, it's actually in building the entire iterative system. There just was a lot of just hard work, painstaking testing, refining, researching, and feedback loops that just had to be fed over and over again. Now the GPT-3 model was something a lot of people had access to. There was a waiting list, but you could use it either in an API or on an online interface. That was a little bit clunky, but it was powerful. People sort of knew what it was doing and it didn't really seem like it caught on with the mainstream. However, when they decided to just package it up into a nice little chat bot and then roll it out there, it just exploded. Everybody on the internet was playing with it and talking about it because the UI just, got better, that sometimes the technology, even with like blockchain, it's like if they just had the UI, it might just click one day. But I digress. Let me let the numbers speak for themselves. In January of 2023, ChatGPT launches. Two months later, a hundred million people are signed up and actively using it. It is the fastest app to ever achieve that user base. 
And I've made countless videos about the GPT technology. I use it all the time for these videos. It is so powerful. And the fact that little things are starting to emerge, we're learning all these new ways to integrate them into data sets with plugins. It is fascinating to see that it's already much smarter than it seems once it just gets broad access and people become better at prompting. I'm convinced that human language, the way we communicate with each other is now gonna be the natural way to start interacting with everything. Whether it's robots of the future, our operating systems, our phones, our smart refrigerators, anything that's technical. So that brings us to today, where it feels like Elon Musk has a little bit of jealousy or whatever you would call it, knowing that he founded that company, he brought that talent over, and he even says openly in a new CNBC video that, you know, I was stupid and I made some mistakes. And, and it gives some context to his early involvement that I thought you might find valuable. I mean, I, 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 I was instrumental in, in recruiting the, the, the key uh, scientists and engineers, most specifically, most notably, uh, Ilya Sotskaya, and ultimately he decided to join OpenAI, and, and really uh, uh, Ilya joining was the was the linchpin for right. uh, OpenAI being ultimately successful. So, so here's some statements that Elon Musk has about OpenAI not being a nonprofit anymore. I fully admit to being a huge idiot here. Let's say you funded an organization to save the Amazon rainforest, and instead they became a, a lumber company <laughs> and chopped down the forest and sold it for money. Well, wait a second, that's uh, the exact opposite of what I gave the money for. Now, luckily, I saw an interview where Ilya answered almost the same question. So let me just put these two juxtaposed to each other. But there is another longer term argument against open sourcing as well, that at some point the capability will become so vast that it will be obviously irresponsible to open source models. Indeed, it would be preferable if OpenAI could just be a, for a non-profit from now until the mission of OpenAI is complete. However, one of the things that's worth pointing out is the very significant cost of these data centers. Quite a bit harder to convince people to give money to a nonprofit. So we came up with an idea that, to my knowledge, is unique in all corporate structures in the world. OpenAI is not a for profit company, it is a capped profit company. Equity in OpenAI can be better seen as a bond rather than equity in a normal company. The main feature of a bond is that once it's paid out, it's gone. So in other words, OpenAI has a finite obligation to its investors, as opposed to an infinite obligation to that normal companies have. Obligation to investors and employees are paid out. OpenAI becomes a nonprofit again. So at this point, all of the wind right now is in the sales of OpenAI. They are in the dominant position. And even though Google has all of the best talent and all of the data, they're actually in total panic mode. And they've combined in an unheard of decision, the DeepMind team, which used to run all on its own with the DeepBrain team and the main Google core products team. So they've brought everyone together to try to come up with something to counteract this lead that OpenAI has jumped into. But Elon Musk thinks that there needs to be a third player in this system too. So he has now started a new company, which is called X.AI. And so far, what we know about X.AI is that he's recruiting top talent, he's funding it mostly himself, but he has looked out to some of the investors in Tesla to bring money into it also. He's made large purchases of GPUs, which can come together to make the kind of supercomputers you need to train these large language models. And in a Fox News interview, he said that he wants to create a large language model, something similar to ChatGPT, but more honest, called TruthGPT. So the next chapter of this story is starting right now. Smash that subscribe button.